The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. It goes all my life a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the nighttime till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Season spinning round again, the years keep rolling by. Top of the morning or the afternoon, I'm Joe Doolittle. And I'm Kate Detting. And this is Story by Story. Celebrating the human spirit. And Kate Dudding and I are storytellers, and we have made a, a, a profession almost, almost profession. Well, you're more professional than I am. <laughs> As really students of storytelling. Uh, we like many aspects of storytelling. As a matter of fact, I guess we like all aspects of storytelling. Um, doing the facts and the figures is a little tedious, ah. but it's necessary when you're producing events. That's right. And we, That's, pro yeah. we produce events, and we uh, are the host of this show, and we're going to talk about storytelling, and we're going to give you some examples of storytelling, and we're going to give you the kind of the status of what's going on, and we've got a really wonderful guest storyteller here for you to listen to. One of the first local storytellers I ever heard. That's true. Last century. Last century. Oh, wow. That's a, well, that's a whole time fob, isn't it? Well, I'm sitting here just kind of feeling overwhelmed and, and soaked in the wonder of summer. Okay. I mean, I've never known wet like we've had it. Uh, and, and the breaks in between have been wonderful summer days, but I'm just overwhelmed by some of the, the wet weather. Um, and I noticed on a trip through the Finger Lakes that people, farmers hadn't been able to hay and things like oh. that just because of all this stuff that's going on in the weather. So, uh, so I've, been, I've been spending some of my summer uh, in the Finger Lakes and up north in, in, at Lake George. What have you been doing with your summer? I went to the National Storytelling Conference in Kansas City. There is a National Storytelling Conference? Uh, yes, and there's a National Storytelling Organization. The National... And Storytelling uh, Network. Uh, it's NSN, and I'm going, and those letters stand really for <laughs> National Storytelling Network. Uh, Storynet.org. And, and when you have a national storytelling conference, how many people show up? I'm, I'm guessing there were about 200 people there. Wow, that's a pretty of good the number. Th a 1,300 membership. Wow. Mm -hmm. And now, do you do you learn things? Do you meet people? What happens at a conference like that? Well, you do that. Um, there's it's more workshops than concerts of storytelling. Mm -hmm. But every time you talk to somebody, uh. you hear what they're doing. Uh, you learn things that way. There are also special interest groups in the National Storytelling Network, such as I belong to, and you, the Producers and Organizers Special Interest Group. There's one on storytelling in schools, through that's through high school. There's one in higher education, storytelling in organizations like uh, businesses. The healing healing Arts and the Healing Arts uh, Alliance. And, and the Healing Storytelling uh, Interest Group is one that I'm a member of, too. Uh, we share that producer's one. Uh, and I want to just talk about it for a minute, because I wasn't at the conference, mm -hmm. but the Healing Storytelling Alliance is about 200 storytellers with a range of interests in the healing arts. And um, one of the things that I think is exceptional is that uh, we and we'll get the schedule out to you. We have monthly conference calls with a featured storyteller talking about an application of storytelling in uh, people with uh, family and child abuse, uh, a whole range of work in in prisons, in hospices, and things. Mental health. Mental health. Uh. And here's the really neat part: these are all archived because we record them. So if you go to www.healingstory.org, you can look at the lineup and you can listen to these resources. And there's bibliographies. And like many of the other special interest groups, there are great resources if you're teaching, if you are pastoring, if you are just interested in a topic. 
Um, so I commend this, the whole organization to you. I couldn't go to the conference this mm -hmm. year, but uh, it's really a wonderful program. And uh, we'll feature more about the healing storytelling conference calls uh, on our upcoming programs in the future because, one, I'd like to promote it. Two, I think you'd be interested, and the best part of it, they're free. <laughs> so. Well, if, if, if you, as most people do, I think, these days, you're, you've got a phone plan that yeah. you can call throughout the United States. It's a one, one, free, one fee to call anywhere you want in the United States for however right, long you right, want. Right, right, right. So the only thing that potentially yeah. is a cost is the, yeah. is the phone, but generally you've already prepaid that. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, well, that must have been interesting, and I and I I really looked at the um, the agenda with some interest. But somehow, just getting out to Kansas City is is, is a trip. By the way, you know, um, just just, just <laughs> going to the center of the country. Yeah. The country is not a hundred miles wide. Yes, right, right. yes, good point. I mean, it's, T well, it takes two plane trips from Albany, but um, hmm. I left at ten in the morning, and I was. There at one thirty in the afternoon, which is really two thirty our time because they're in the center. You can go through time. So it's uh, and I was in my hotel room by three thirty. So there you go. But you throw out some money for that. But I it, the 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 theme of the conference was on immigration and migration, and so we heard a lot of stories about immigrants, uh, some told by themselves. Uh, the, the Healing Storytelling Alliance had a pre-conference, a full day pre-conference, right. and then they ended that day with a uh, concert. Mm -hmm. The first teller was a fellow who said, I grew up in Guatemala. My family made dolls. They're, they're like folk art kind yeah. of little dolls, not like all American, American girl, girl dolls. Not, no, no. And it's a tradition that, that children in Guatemala s sleep with them under their pillows because they will listen to the bad dreams and, and, and help with them. Oh. So the family, but they're, it's a limited market within Guatemala for these dolls. But when the tourists came, oh. were coming, it was, it, that's how their family lived. What a story for the tourists. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> However, when Civil War came in Guatemala, there were no tourists. Their family had no income. They had to leave or starve to death. And so they came to the United States as undocumented immigrants. Ah. So it's, I don't think, and then somebody else said, you have to remember that immigrants are very brave. They are coming to a place where they have to learn everything all over again usually a language, sometimes even an alphabet. Right. Yeah. And, and everything, um, you know, things like food. I didn't know this till I did research on Julia Child, but the gluten content in flour differs by region. And so she had a hard time figuring out the recipe for French bread because the gluten content in f flour in France is different than the gluten content in Things the United States. Things you never States. knew. So if you're used to making, and I think Margaret French said, um, because she used to be married to a, a man from India, that little Indian tortillas. I know that's I, just I completely know. wrong. Right. But anyways, a little 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 thing that you, bread-like thing that you fry up. The flour here isn't the same as in India. So you, you, what, you, what you really crave for, you can't even make. Yeah. So, you know, immigrants are brave. Um, they've probably come, you know, you don't, you don't leave your home country for a trivial matter. No, you don't. And, and, and you leave a lot behind. And then one fellow said, he was working with Sue O'Halloran in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. She has been working for many years on a play, on a, to bring, bridge races together. And she has a website, racebridges. It's either org or .com, but racebridges. 
you know, R-A-C-E bridges. bridges, no hyphens or anything. Just Google that, you'll find it. Uh, and she talked to a fellow who was from Vietnam. He, uh, the boat he was on to escape Vietnam sank. Luckily, a, a gas container came by. He clung to that for two days was rescued by Cambodian fishermen who, who were not supposed to, were, it was against the law to do that, but he, they rescued him and he got into a, a refugee camp in Cambodia. And he made friends with a, a young man called Tom who had been in the camp for seven Ooh. years. And they were friends, but one day <clears throat> this young man found Tom and he had hung himself from Ooh. a tree. He just, he just couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't take it anymore. Ugh. And he told Sue that, you know, this is the first time I've told anyone that story about Tom. And later he told it in, in a gathering, a public uh, storytelling event. And afterwards he told Sue, you know, I, I, I now feel that I'm home. People have listened to my story where I'm from, and, and now I feel that I'm, finally, I'm home here. Mm. So. As you were talking, I'm reminded of a line from a book by Barry Lopez called Crow and Weasel, which is about two Indians, Braves, and uh, they meet a character who makes the line, sometimes people need story more than food. Mm -hmm our stories care for us mm -hmm. and in a way as terrible as that story was the expression of the story actually is a caring event mm -hmm. in the lives of the teller and also I think in the lives of the listener mm -hmm. um, so that that's a remarkable now, the web and, and just one one more one more little thing is an, another speaker said she was doing work in a in a school in Michigan and a third grader who was an immigrant said, I don't even know what to be afraid of here. Don't know. So I guess he was afraid of everything. Wow. That guy needed a doll to put under yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so. so if you want the website to, re to kind of look at these things, it's National Storytelling Network, and that's storynet.org. Yeah. And then there's a link there to all these special interest groups, including healingstory.org, which is the healing storytelling program. And, and I encourage you to, to, to go visit because uh, there's a great wealth of information there, and you can find stories and links that may care for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of caring for us, <laughs> you know that? One of the people that I've cared a lot about in storytelling <laughs> is Mary Murphy. I think she was one of the first people I heard tell a story to. Um, and it was about a wide mouth frog. And I was so impressed that she could get her mouth to be that big. Um, she did such a great wide mouth frog. Um, and she's captivated me ever since. But I, I think the first story that I heard was about Olivia and her Barbie dolls. Oh, that and was good too. The bridal doll your mother gave you. Oh, so dolls kind of are a feature. Oh, today. oh, I guess so. And we'd like to introduce you to this doll of a storyteller, <laughs> Mary Murphy, direct from you, not from Kansas City, all the way from Albany, New York. Yes. Mary, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be on this show. Well, we're really looking forward to it. Certainly pleased to have you. And as I was talking all about you. I realized that I, I, I just can't remember a pivotal bit of information, and that's how you actually started as a storyteller. Well, one thing that I'm interested in is that, uh, and we can certainly talk about this oh, okay. later, but, but I know that you mentioned the wide mouth frog. Yes, I did. I keep and it in you mind. mentioned New Friends, mm -hmm. New Friends, which is a story that I wrote about mm -hmm. uh, and is told to adults. Ah. Uh, but the wide mouth frog is a story that I started with. I mean, that is my very first story. And, and before I tell you how I got into storytelling, I will just okay. say that. Segue to the wide mouth frog, yes, okay. <laughs> there was this woman named Louise Kessel. I have no idea where she is now, but I believe she was from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And she came up to uh, Colony Center one day, and she was in Macy's. Like, she was smack dab in the middle of Macy's, and she had little chairs surrounding her, and she had a microphone in her own chair. And there were kids, and there were parents, not a lot. But I heard her tell this story, The Wide Mouth Frog. And as soon as I heard it, 
I said, I know that story. I mean, I had never heard it before, mm -hmm. but it just came into mm -hmm. me. And uh, so I have her to thank for telling her own version. And since then, I've, I've mm -hmm. heard 150,000 mm -hmm. of them, really. But uh, And then somebody, oddly enough, uh, called me. This was a few years ago, who was, who was publishing a book about storytelling. And she said, my niece and nephew uh, told me about a storyteller who told them the wide mouth mm -hmm. frog one time. And I've always wanted to, to, to hear. It was a woman. I always wanted to hear her tell it. And finally, I found you on the internet. I'm not sure how. And she heard me telling that version of the wide mouth frog that they loved. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure even what city she's from. But uh, this woman, Louise, was from North Carolina and came to Albany and dropped off her story before she went back. And then I, in turn, infect, infected somebody or affected. <laughs> affected. <laughs> affected someone. Affected, infected. It's a very small yes. change of words. Right. Change of letters. In, in, in some other part of the country. Mm. And I, it just goes to show you how storytelling can, uh, can the stories change with each teller, mm. but they're passed on and mm. they grow and they grow and it's, it's a very organic and, and, thing. And, and people from different backgrounds respond to them and yes. they remember stories. Lectures, usually not so much. Not so much. Stories, I always think of like the priest in, in, in church, and, and uh, he gets up to give a sermon, you know, and everybody's thinking about, you know, when I get out, what am I going to make for dinner? What am I going to do yeah. afterwards? Are we going to go sailing? I, I think she's wearing a new outfit. I wonder where she got that. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Right, right. And then all of a sudden, he'll say, and when I was a boy, my mother and I did this. Right. And there's that quiet that comes right. over everyone. Right. Right. They want to hear the story. Everything changes. Mm -hmm. His voice changes. The speed of everything changes. And suddenly, everyone is right there with him. I've seen it happen a million times. Yeah. And yeah. you, too. You, you, you've seen that. Seen it, yeah. Well, I, and when I chaplain over at Albany Med as a volunteer, I have uh, breakfast often with a Father Bob Leone, who's one of the chaplains of Albany Med. And he actually passes his homilies around the hospital in an email because people are, want his message, but what they want is that embedded story that he's built into his homily. And, and he'll say, people will walk around, they won't remember anything of the real message, but they'll remember the story. But, right. but if you right. remember the story, the, and the in message that way. is right. in right. the, the story. story right. and, you know, I, I was taught, you don't end. And the moral of this story is, for, for a couple of reasons, one, I, I, well, I think it, you're, you're speaking down to your right. audience. Right. Two, um, really, people hear their own, hear what they ha what they need to hear, and they come up with their own message in the story. And um, hmm, maybe that's it. But but it's 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 oh, it's limiting. And if you say this is the moral, people go, oh, I thought it was that. I guess I was wrong. And it was like, no, 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 no. Yours is yours is better than 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 Aesop. Uh, <laughs> And so one of the hardest things, if I could just say, one of the hardest things to do, I find, in my storytelling, is that to say, the end. Okay, you can clap now. <laughs> and, but to give that audience a chance to, yes, digest. Settle. Mm -hmm. yeah, settle. Reflect, yeah, yeah. Think of the story, take it in, uh -huh. and do what they want with it. Right. And that's a very hard thing. I try to get my students. But you, you said one remarkable thing. You know, you said that I knew that story as you were yeah. you were you were integrating it into yourself as you listen to it. Right. And 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 that's a special relationship between the teller and you because that doesn't happen very often. No. And no. and so, so the first rule of storytelling is only tell stories you love, and that story, or that resonate with you, if you will. But right. And one of the other lessons is if you want to become a storyteller, you stumble into a storyteller in Macy's. That's kind of how <laughs> right. it happens. You. It's, it's a good place to shop. Chapter one. Chapter one. Chapter shop one. Shop in Macy's. Uh, enough of this talk about stories. Do you have a story that you can share with us? Yes. Yes. But do you want to hear how we got into storytelling? Sure. Sure. Uh, <laughs> That story too. <laughs> no, the reason why I'm going to, to tell it is because I wanted to I wanted to tell stories for children. But I started as a lover of the theater and a lover of acting, and um, I, I even got degrees in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school for drama, and um, when I finished. I went to New York City, Whoa. and I started right out auditioning and singing, and my aunt was down there with me, and I had a place to stay, and I actually met my husband. 
I was going to say my first husband for some reason, but, well, but the well, one that is only. true. <laughs> Gay refers to me as, as her first husband. Yeah. I, think, so. <laughs> I refer to mine as my late husband. Late husband. Oh, <laughs> yes. oh, he's, he's often late. He's still alive. Back on track. Yes. You're in oh, New York yeah, City. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good at getting us back. But anyway, when I when I did finally move up to Albany, Leo and I, um, I wanted to continue with my performing. So it was a matter of loving the performance idea mm -hmm. and channeling that into something that I could have control of, unlike a, a community theater or right. something where I'd, I'd have to be um, um, in an organization. And I stumbled upon storytelling. I started with uh, poems by Shel Silverstein. Oh, and I found them, and, and, and I just love them. But of course, they're written by Shel Silverstein. And uh, I did them in school a little bit and gave him credit. But then when I went a little further and a little deeper, of course, I found folk tales, uh -huh. starting with uh, The Legend of uh, Sleepy Hollow. I think that was my very, very first one. And a storytelling uh, librarian out in Voorheesville gave me my first chance to do a performance. And I did it for kids. And I realized, as, as you probably know, that, that, that kids listen on a whole different level. Uh, they actually start breathing with you as you're telling the story. And, yes. and, and, and little ones, preschoolers, if you do a gesture, they, 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 they just do it. They're not, you know, right. constant, you know they, they just, it just happens. Right, they're, they're, right. And if they ask you a question, then the question sort of leads, it, it doesn't throw you off or say, no, no, wait a minute, I can't answer that. It just sort of organically changes the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, so I, I love storytelling, and when I got around to it, I made a, a CD called Murphy Stew. Okay. It started out I, I as a tape. It a tape. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> started out as a tape. I didn't know what a CD was. And I had a lot of my favorite stories on and, and they were stories for kids. And I realized as I was coming to this show today how much my storytelling has changed. But I sort of wanted to get back to my roots today. Mm. And as you mentioned the wide mouth frog, that was the story that I was thinking about telling. So if I may, that's a long introduction, I know, <laughs> tell you. You're going to tell us the law, the, the white mouth, mouth frog. Oh, ooh, blessings ooh, of ooh, the ooh, day. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm, I'm just wondering if Joe's going to sing with me, that's all. I might. All right. All right. I will, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago, there was a little green animal hopping through the forest. Now. It wasn't just any kind of a little green animal, it was a frog. And it wasn't just any kind of a frog, it was a, a wide mouth frog. This frog's mouth was so big, it was as big as his whole body. And he was a very, very happy frog. But he had one problem. He was very, very curious always asking questions of all the other animals in the forest. And they were getting sick and tired of listening to him. But he didn't know that. So one morning he woke up, it was a beautiful day. And he hopped in the forest. And whenever he hopped in the forest, he had this little tiny song he used to sing. Wide mouth frog, oh, wide mouth frog, how very great it is to be a wide mouth frog. Boink, oh. Boink! Something fell down on top of the wide mouth frog and hit him right on top of the head. A whole bunch of somethings. He looked up and he saw that he was standing underneath a coconut tree and a coconut had fallen down and hit him on top of the head. But while he was looking up in that tree, he saw the kind of animal that likes to climb up the tree and swing from the branches. It was a monkey. But it wasn't just any kind of a monkey. It was a mother monkey, and she had four babies. So the wide mouth frog looked right up at that mother monkey and said, Mother monkey, mother monkey, but do you feed your babies for dinner? Oh, oh, said the monkey. I feed my babies uh, bananas, coconuts, dates, and figs. Would you like to join us? And the wide mouth frog said, no, thank you, but have a very nice day. And as soon as he found out the answer to his question, he was happy. And he hopped on down the road, singing his little song. Wide mouth frog, wide mouth frog, how very great it is to be a wide mouth frog. Oh. But now the 
wide-mouthed frog got to the deepest, darkest, scariest part of the forest. And all around him, on every side, little animals were running out of the forest, and they were motioning for him to run out of the forest, too. But the wide-mouthed frog was so very, very curious that he kept on hopping until last he got back to the deepest, darkest, scariest part of the forest. And he saw a den. And in the den, he saw the kind of animal that has a mane and is king of the jungle. It was a lion. But it wasn't just any kind of a lion. It was a mother lion, and she had four babies. So the wide mouth frog hopped right up to that mother lion and said, Mother lion, mother lion, what do you feed your babies for dinner? The lion said, roar. I feed my baby squirrels and raccoons and other little animals in the forest. Would you like to join us? And the white mouth frog said, no, thank you, but have a very nice day. He started hopping kind of fast out of that deep, dark part of the forest. When he got outside, though, and felt the warm sun pouring down on him, and he, he realized he was safe. He started singing his little song. You can sing that little song with me. All you have to do is make your mouth as big as you possibly can and widen up your eyes as wide as they possibly can and sing along. Wide mouth frog! Wide mouth frog! How great it is to be a wide mouth frog! There are some very big mouths in this room, I'll tell you. Now, don't you think it's time for the little wide mouth frog to go home and, and see his own mommy and eat his own dinner? Well, that's what I thought. But the wide mouth frog was so very, very curious that he kept on hopping. And oh, he made a mistake. For he came to a river. And in that river, there was that long, green kind of animal with a big, wide mouth of its own and a row upon a row of white, shiny teeth. It was a crocodile. But it wasn't just any kind of a crocodile. It was a mother crocodile, and she had one, two, three, four, four babies. babies. And so the wide mouth frog hopped right up to that mother crocodile and looked up at her and said, Mother crocodile, mother crocodile, what do you feed your babies for dinner? And the mother crocodile got a great big crocodile smile on her face. And she looked down at that little wide mouth frog. And she said, I feed my babies wide mouth frog. Oh, said the wide mouth frog. She didn't make it mother small because she couldn't make it. I didn't know that. And the wide mouth frog looked up, and as he was looking up, the mother crocodile bent down, and she said, Would you like to join us? And the wide mouth frog said, no, thank you, but have a very nice day. And he started hopping backwards away from that river as fast as his little green legs would carry him. He was so scared that he decided to sing his song to keep his courage up. But he couldn't sing it like he usually did. He had to sing it like this. Wait, 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 and he sat down and ate it. It was wide mouth flies. <laughs> it's absolute favorite. But you know, he learned a big lesson after that. He was never very, very curious again. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. It's better than I remembered it. Oh, it takes me back to my roots. Oh, man. I love it. I love I mean, it. And how it, kids would jump in and say what the animal was and, and sing the song and everything. I, I, uh, I just, you know, I hadn't thought about that story until I walked in the room here and, and saw you. And it, it was the, 
early in my collection with you saying, oh, Mary's your wide mouth frog. So there you go. Of course, yeah. there's a great big hairy toe is, is, comes from that era, too, I think. Right. Which, right. which is not, a, I know this is not a toe, but it's, it's the closest I can come to at the moment. I saw that in one of those Appalachian Folktales mm -hmm. books, and it was rather short. Mm -hmm. um, and it was rather gruesome, you know, chopping off the toe and everything. But uh, I wanted to tell it for little kids. And so I found something by a woman named Ann Rockwell. And she had written a book called Thump, Thump, Thump. It was a picture book, mm -hmm. and it was very short. And it told about a big monster who was looking for his toe because it got cut off while he was sleeping. And he found it, and he was happy. And that sort of gave me the impetus to take a story that maybe isn't for kids necessarily mm -hmm. and turn it into something that little ones would like, always making sure that there's sort of these boundaries of safety mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. not, 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 not cleaning it up or cleansing it or anything, but just making sure that they can relate to it and enjoy it on their mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But when I heard the story the first time, you were telling it to um, either at a celebration or a story circle meeting, so it was really not a group, but it wasn't an audience of young kids. So mm -hmm. you actually changed the the venue in a way for that story. And I'll bet you that some of the bigger people that were watching the show enjoyed that story mm -hmm. just as much as the little people. And I bet you they even sang along. Yes, well, I bet they did. Storytellers, I, by and large, are pretty much in, in touch with their inner child. Or sometimes the inner child is, is at the surface. Uh, <laughs> It could be. Uh, could be. It certainly is in this group of storytellers. Mm -hmm. That's true. See, but you bring up a, you bring up a good point. I think uh, uh, when you say that adults are willing to listen, because when I started, and um, I, I don't know how many years ago that was, but but you know, I would go into a school, and there would be a, a nice group of kids in front of me, and in the back, the teachers are are um, are grading papers, or they're walking in and out, or they're not really paying attention, and and I don't mean anything against teachers. Now, what I say. I'm thinking in terms of adults. Or you go to a library, and the parents are chit-chatting in the back. And um, I think it was at that time when I started that storytelling was thought of as something for kids. Now, do you find that true, or did you find that true when you started out? That you, Because I know neither of one yeah. of you really started out in schools or telling stories that way. Am I right? Well, I started out telling my kids stories. Oh, oh. Uh, so, in a way, that was the yeah. early venue. Oh, um, and, and I was reading to my son's first grade and second grade classes, yeah. and I read a story by J.O. Callahan. I said, oh, I can tell this. And it was like, a, I had five pages of notes. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not a, any, but it worked. But it worked. And I, I got the Herman the Worman, and I like my squirm, and I like being down in the ground, something like that. Well, did you have that experience then? I'm glad to hear you say that. Well, yeah, that, that I did some, some birthday parties, and I had to explain that, um, that people need to listen when I'm telling a story, and if the parents are chatting in the background, which I understand why they want to do it, because they haven't seen each other, it really is distracting for me, and it's distracting for the kids. So if they want to do that, they need to go to another room. But if they want to join in, and if I'm having a public performance, I like to have families sit together, because I go, then you're really sharing the story. Right. And then, and whenever the kid, what I really love about that is whenever their kid joins in, the parents are going, that's my kid. My kid, did you hear that? My kid, that, he sang the loudest of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so I call that a double beaming effect. The kid is beaming because the kid did it, and the parents are beaming because it's their kid. It's their kid, yeah. that's right. So right. It's, it's, but yeah. it's a sense that, yeah, oh, yeah. you're a storyteller. Oh, well, why don't you talk to the children? Right, right, yes. Right. Why don't you? Yes. It's, it's, it was relegated or so. Storytelling right, right, right. is not, I have a bumper shirt. Storytelling is not just for kids. That's yeah. right. That's right. And I think gradually one of the biggest changes I've seen in storytelling is that that's just not true anymore. Well, and I, and I think I can remember, uh, for me, the, the, the story circle, our guild, was the introduction because my wife Gay saw a notice in the paper and said, "This is what you do." And I've been telling stories in in my staff development work in my graduates classes and stuff, but I hadn't been telling the kids except for my own, and maybe a little at Sunday school. Uh, 
But that was a group. And then when I came back to the area from Buffalo, I went to a guild meeting, and people were talking about only having a venue where, you know, this very problem. And we got together, and that's how Story Sunday started, was uh, we said, well, we can fix this. <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> Carol, Carol yeah. Connolly and Jane Ainsley did a, a public celebration. Yeah. And and then <coughs> then three more two more happened and we had a mailing list of like five hundred people. And and I, I think the conversation went Joe, we have 500 potential listeners. We're only giving them something once a year. Can't we do something? And you said... I know Angelo Mazzone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. That was... And Angelo, when I told him what we wanted, he said, <clears throat> so you want me to teach, treat you guys like the Rotary Club? And I said, I guess so. And, uh, <laughs> That's the cheapest... Uh, yeah, yeah. We can get. So, so that became the... And, and that Sunday night's a, 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 a lull time for my private parties. So that would give my staff more work to do. If we if we yes. uh, if we had to renegotiate again, I'd get a percentage of the bar bill too. That's the we gave him the bar bill. That was the probably the only people who listen to stories drink. And they were, no, no. <laughs> Not necessarily, but we sometimes they leave their wine over here until they're done telling stories. That's true. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's right. Oh uh, yeah, you too. Yes. yes. But I, I think I think that it's unfortunately it's developed with the moth and this it's American getting life. Better. It's getting it's getting uh, uh, better and and a lot more meaningful um, as as a as method and if you think about how much we talk about method in terms of how you tell and mm -hmm. what kind of genre it works and things. Um, it, it's really it's really come a long way. Oh, it's come a long way. And see, the thing is that when you're mentioning the moth and things like that, people are seeing themselves as storytellers. That's true. Now, uh, in the uh, spring, in March, I did a workshop in at the Easton Library, mm -hmm. and it was for uh, uh, seniors, I guess you would say, and uh, to write a memory story and publish it in a book. And I, I thought no one... No one would would write. I was really that's what the that's what the organizer, excuse me, the organizers wanted, and uh, and so we made it a writing workshop. But I never dreamed they'd want to write these stories down, but they did, and they were so eager to tell the stories, to read the stories, and now we're putting them into a book with my, my husband Leo is helping and, and uh, uh, turning it into a publication. Really? And Great. A printed book, right, and we're, we're thrilled to do it. The stories are so good because, yeah. you know, of course people say, oh, I'm not a storyteller, right. I could never be a storyteller and that kind of thing, but then when they start bringing up their memories, their their faces change. I mean, the the sort of blood comes into their cheeks and their their eyes sort of light up. I mean, you've seen it a hundred times. Right, right. I saw a cat. I was, I like to when I'm um, uh, in the audience of uh, storytelling. I like to be able to see the teller, and I like to be able to see some of the audience. Yes. And I saw it was one of the early celebrations, either the second or the third. Because uh, we were at G's Research Center when they still had an auditorium, and someone was on stage, and Kathleen Gill was over there, and suddenly I I saw what she looked like when she was ten years old. Yeah, she was in her fifties then, I bet, and yeah. and it hiked the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but then, but her face just just she was enthralled with the story and. Right. It was wonderful. Right. And then as you know also that, that people can tell a story or, or uh, the storyteller can tell a story or someone from the audience and it brings up the memories of other people and then they begin telling the right, story. Right. All they have to do is feel that you really want to hear. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they might be uh, intimidated by a performance or something like that, but really when you, when you can put the performance aside and hear the tale, the story, the, it's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah I, I sometimes think about that as the generative power of story that after you have told in a situation like the round table of the moth and somebody else gets up who's inspired and encouraged by your story or the person who gets that funny look on their face while you're telling and something you've said has taken them some other place and they've just followed their own little story and they're gone yeah and I used to wonder I used to worry about that but the more I listen to that, that was a good thing because they had actually picked up on the story themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Well, we're, 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 we're 38 minutes out of our 58, so we, we need to go on. Oh, to okay. We've got to do a commercial break about oh, storytelling. Yes. Uh, coming attractions. There are not lots. So we'll get back to Mary. Don't go away. Um, a number of our monthly events are on summer break. First Tuesday's Tales and Stuff, the open uh, mic for storytelling up in Saratoga, Shawnake <coughs> Evenings at the Irish American Heritage Museum, and the Interface Story Circle program are all on summer break, but they will be back in September. And unfortunately, Janet Carter has is moving south to the, still in the Hudson Valley, so not going too far, but she will no longer be living in Saugerties, so the, her series at the Inquiring Minds Bookstore in Saugerties is over. It's over. But the, the next Story Circle meeting will be on Wednesday, August 16th at the Pine Hills branch of the Albany Public Library. At 6.15, we have some sort of learning session. Uh, somebody must get working on that. Yep. It's usually a roundtable discussion. And um, then at 7 to 9, we have sharing of stories under development. Uh, only telling, no reading, please. Listeners are welcomed. And if you're telling a story, you can say, I just wanted to tell it to people. Thank you very much. Or you can hear the, the nice things. What do we call them? Uh, affirmations. Affirmations. And then, or you can ask, you know, if anybody had, had a problem or they have suggestions. Or we, I, was, I, I wanted to make sure people knew who was talking when the mother and the daughter were talking. Was that clear? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. The teller is in charge. Mm -hmm. So, and we're, we're very kind. Okay. We don't go, you know, that's the worst story. Ever. Have you ever heard a story <laughs> well, worse than that? Done. And, no. you know, the, no, no, the, no, no, the no. nicest thing for us as, as kind of longer term storytellers is when a new storyteller shows up and wants to try something out. Mm -hmm. And that's always refreshing and it's fun. And so if you're out there, we encourage you to show up at one of the story circle meetings and tell a story. Mm -hmm. But a really fabulous series that does happen in the summer is at Schoharie Crossing in Fort Hunter, New York, just beyond Amsterdam. The Not Just for Kids Storytelling has been going on, this is its 26th season. It's free, Sunday nights, rain or shine, and starting at 6 p.m. And we have fabulous tellers. Well, we. <laughs> well, it's, really, uh, it's a member of the guild that's hosting right, that. Right, right. Um, yeah. But um, mm. other than telling people about it, I really have nothing to do with it. Occasionally, I'm a teller. Not this year. Uh, but it, since this is our August program, uh, if you're seeing this early in August, Elizabeth Ellis is one of my mentors, a fabulous storyteller from Dallas. She, uh, but she grew up in Appalachia. And so um, she's a, she's uh, she's in the circle. She's not only in the circle of excellence of the National Storytelling Network, but she's in the Lifetime Achievement Award. Yep. Uh, group. So then Peter Cook is on the thirteenth. He's a deaf teller, so he signs and he has a companion who speaks. But he, he, but telling isn't just about speech, it's body and face mm -hmm. and movement. Then Michael Reno Harrell, uh, who is another out-of-towner, is coming in. Then Joe Bruchak will be on the 27th, even though he's local from Greenfield Center. He's, he's internationally known. And then Becky Holder on September 10th will be ending it. She was one of the founders of Story Circle. Right. And a fabulous storyteller. And then just to give you a little preview of events coming, series coming back to life in September, first Tuesdays, Tales and Stuff, which Joe organizes at Arthur's Market in the Stockade in Schenectady, we'll have Dan Testo on September 5th. That's the day after Labor Day. Day after Labor Day, first Tuesday, and, and Dan Testo is a member of the Guild who's not been all that active except for what he's done in his teaching roles, and he's retired, and I crossed trail with him at Jumping Jacks in Scotia, and I said, you Fine should tell, tell. <laughs> you should tell. So come out on that first Monday, or first Tuesday after Labor Day, and uh, he Dan will have about 25 minutes of stories, and it's an opportunity for anybody to perform. So, And then the 125th Story Sunday 
will be with October 1st, featuring Mary Murphy and Barbara Chapitis wow. at the Glenn Sanders Mansion, 5 to 8. Three choices of three different entrees. Is there a title yet? There's no title Not yet, title, but it will but involve ghost stories. Ghost stories. Ooh. Ooh. Scary Sang stuff. Ooh. Sang Ooh. Sang yes. <laughs> Barbara used to be one of the snickering witches. She's, she's got ghost Snickering. 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 No, snickering. 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 Not snickering. snickering. Okay. And then just some save the dates. Story Sunday will be happening five times this season. It's 19th season, 19 years. My goodness. Longer than some marriages. We are married not to each other. Uh, but two in October, January, February, and April. Then we also have a season at Proctor's, 2 o'clock on Sunday <laughs> afternoons, called Word Plays, with these five topics. And our celebration will be on November 12th, stories about challenges. Challenges. And then there's also a spinoff of Word Plays, Word Plays at the Cabaret in Fort Salem, well, in Salem, New York, at the Fort Salem Theater. And we're at our fourth season there. And if you can't get out or if TV is driving you crazy because nothing is new or worth watching, come to our YouTube channel, storycircle.org. Click on YouTube and over 200 stories, mostly from this TV show, mm -hmm. are available on demand, as they say. And that's quite a lineup for us taking the summer off, don't you know? Yes. There you go. Yes. So uh, now we have uh, 12 minutes left. All right. What, will, what should we talk? You got to give a you have a ten minute story. No, I don't have a ten minute story, but I'd much rather talk to you. But I will tell a story. Okay. okay. This is another throwback story, and I. Is this like a fish that you throw it back because you don't want to keep it, or no? What? It's like you jump in after. Oh, it, okay. And it's called the split dog. <laughs> <laughs> I had me a little dog once. Was the best rabbit hunting dog you ever saw. Well, he was running after a rabbit one day, and some fool had left a scythe lying in the grass with the blade pointed straight up. Well, my little dog was running so hard and so fast that he didn't see it. He ran smack into it, and it split him open from the tip of his nose right straight on down his tail. Lucky thing, I saw it happen. And I ran over my little doggy, and I said, oh, no. But I, but, but, but I scooped up half of my dog in one hand, and, and I, I scooped up the other half of my dog in the other hand, and I slapped him back together again. And then I took off my coat and I wrapped him up in that right quick. I could see he was still breathing, and I didn't want to lose this little doggy of mine, so I, I went home and put him in a box. And I put him near the stove at night so he'd be warm. And during the day, I brought him outside and let the warm sunshine pour down on him. I was really worried, but, but I did this for three weeks, every night and every day, until I finally got up my nerve to look in that box and see if he was all right. Well... Well, I went over and I looked in, and I saw him start to wiggle a little bit. So I said, oh, Mary, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. I kept him bandaged for another three weeks just to be on the safe side. And then one day I was walking along that box. What do you think I heard? Woof. Woof. <laughs> Woof. He barked. Oh, my land, I cried. I took him out of the box. I brought him outside. I started unwrapping him, and in a few minutes, out he jumped. Surprise ever. But, don't you know, in my excitement, I did a terrible thing to that little dog of mine. You don't want to put it back together? I put him together the wrong way, too. He had two legs sticking up in the air and two legs down on the ground. Half of his head was pointing north and the other half of his head was pointing south. I just looked at my weird dog and I said, I ruined my little dog. I just ruined him. My little dog was looking at me with half of his tongue going, Lord knows where the other half was, but I think it was down by his tail. Well, I was crying and, and he's panting. But all at once, my little dog saw another rabbit. And he took off running after it. And do you know he turned out to be an even better rabbit hunting dog after that? He'd run on two legs, and when he got tired, he'd just run on the other two legs. My little doggy could run, going and coming. And you know what else he could do? He could bark at both ends. That's the story about my dog. 
and well, I'm sure your CD, now, does your CD have that story on it? It doesn't. You it know, does. I think I, I, I realized that it didn't, but I think I, t I learned it right after mm -hmm. and I've been telling it low these yes. many years. But they didn't, oh. the, the, your doggy face was, is, is, is priceless oh, and, and just wouldn't have popped out, well, you're so animated that people would, with good imaginations, would would have figured you would have some wonderful face. But it you was know, a particularly wonderful dog. You face. know, I've heard you tell that story too, and I knew what was coming, and it didn't make any difference. Well, we laughed. You said, a, "I've got a story called that." We both laughed, right. and going, uh, "Oh, you uh, people must wonder what, what, <laughs> what is going on." Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's one of those stories that bridges the gap too. I mean, I mean, adults love that story, and kids love that mm -hmm. story, and. And uh, they'll see kids will see it one way, and adults will see it another. So it's it's a story that you don't have to change that much for either group. I, I don't know if you've, yeah, you've had yeah, that, that experience. Yeah, you no, don't have to don't uh, make it uh, simpler, mm -hmm. and you don't have to make it more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. It's just enjoyable for mm -hmm. both right. groups. And, they'll, and and you certainly don't want to get into any detail on the anatomy of that story. Oh, no. right. Because <laughs> I'm going. Well, what happened? To, what was the other side of the? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, face yeah, was. Yeah. Where, yeah, 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 yeah. And, then, and you're thinking about your own dog. And they say, wait a minute, I don't want to think about my own dog. <laughs> no, no, and, no, and also, no. when, when it's kids, I say, I slapped them back together again. I sort of mush them up a little bit. Just to give a little more color to it, a little more flavor. <laughs> But, but you went like this. <laughs> but maybe, maybe in the time we have left, we could talk about yes. uh, this this kind of stuff. Now I'll be I'll be at a number of nursing homes and rehabilitation centers and senior centers mm -hmm. um, over the rest of the summer, mm -hmm. and uh, and the story Sundays are are for and the not just for kids storytelling mm -hmm. and all of that kind of thing. Uh, so it sort of brings us to the fact that stories are for everybody, and tellers now sort of. I mean, I've gotten older. I don't know. I, I probably don't look it, but uh, I've, I've gotten a little bit older. And uh, I don't have the energy I once did. I don't have the energy to go into a school and have all these kids in front of me and, and keep them spellbound. And, and when you talk all these kids, you're talking an assembly oh, of three, 500, four. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, easily. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. With a microphone, and that's all you've got between you and, and, them, yeah. and those kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So I, I enjoy telling the stories where I can sit still. And I sort of had to learn a new way of storytelling. I can certainly have still the energy in my own face, my own way of telling. But now I sort of take it in more and tell it and watch their um, watch their mannerisms and watch how they're giving me back so much mm -hmm. it's a quieter storytelling but nonetheless it's 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 a very rewarding kind of storytelling and of course we yeah. talked about the fact that people then tell you their own stories yes. right. or and, and you know just when people are having a conversation they go that reminds me of when right Right, you know, right, and that you dropped the carton of eggs. I dropped. Uh, oh, my son <laughs> dropped a gallon of bubble fluid. I had made it up. <laughs> well, the, right by the stairs, you know. <laughs> I'm, re I'm reminded of uh, of one other event, and, and this is a little bit of a plug for the Story Circle meetings. The warm up for the meeting, the centering process of each of us telling a short story or vignette about what the most interesting thing that happened or whatever and the, the facilitator has to come up with that question and and that is actually wonderful drill for creating a story because mm -hmm. you don't know what's coming you you you're spontaneous or more spontaneous than you might be in another setting and everybody's on an equal footing so that the newbie you know, was telling the same story as the old pro, and and you get everybody into a, a mix of stuff, mm -hmm. and that mix actually sets the theme of the mm -hmm. meeting. I remember when Lois um, Hodges. Hodges used to do little reflections on our meetings, she would often go back and said the theme was, and the theme would be whatever that question had been mm -hmm. in terms of the response. So my, my point is that I think that Yes, adults kind of get generative with stories, and often it doesn't take much more than a little bit of a question. No, or, or if you're in a writing workshop, which I've been in several recently, where they give you that free write time. And, and the, uh, one one uh, time I was there, and the the leader of the workshop he said that it's uh, the theme tonight or uh, for this question is crushes that you had. Oh. 
And I didn't know, and I'm writing. He said, just write. Put pencil to paper and start writing. And all of a sudden, this crush came into my head, this time when I was a little kid, and I fell in love with Ray Bolger, who was uh, in The Wizard of Oz. And, and I wrote about that. And it became a story for me. Yeah. It, it was just wonderful. I, I never entered the room with that. Mm. I had no, I was despairing when I started out. But if you give yourself a chance, there's mm -hmm. a story in mm -hmm. these things. I, I, I wasn't thrilled with the idea of story slams, which is a storytelling competition, but I've participated in some at the New England Storytelling Conference and at the National Conference, and they give you about a month's warning of what the topic is. And I've gotten two really good stories, I feel, out of that. You know, where am I from, which is the final story on my uh, learning about Muslims um, CD. And then also on that CD is the story about children at the well, which was prompted by many stories, uh, w many people, oh, many worlds. Many worlds, worlds many stories. Is, uh, okay. One heart, I don't know, something at the National Storytelling Conference. But you won the competition then. That that exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. 2010, <laughs> Los yep. Angeles. Yep. So there was some, one of the other tellers said the math was wrong and he really had won, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sour, uh, grapes. sour grapes. Sour yeah. grapes, definitely. Yes. But, no one, no one in our group. No one in our group. But, anyways, yes, having a topic thrown at you and going, well, I don't have anything about that. Well, maybe I do. Yeah. yeah. And and something I learned. Janine Laverty was also one of my mentors and teachers. When she did uh, weekend workshops up in the Adirondacks, she was also developing a story at the same time. So not only was she was teaching us. But she was going through this process herself. She had a number of exercises. And so that taught me, yes, she's been telling stories for 20 years, but each story is a new adventure. Right. She, she, I believe, described it as these were helping you, you develop a relationship with your story. Um, which to me, I translated as you, you figure out why, why you're drawn to it. Uh, because I find once I can figure that out, I can come up with an intention of why I'm going to tell it. And that really focuses me on right. what needs to be included, what, what would is just distraction or fluff. Um, Right, you need to you have that beginning, middle, and end. Oh well, yeah, that, that, yeah. Those, those are those, those are important things. Tom Weekly, I think, pointed that out to me the first time I told it at Story Circle. Mm -hmm. Once this, no, it was it was Ruth uh, who used to come with him right. from Vermont. So you know, once the story has a beginning, middle, and end, it'll be really good. I went, oh right, <laughs> oh, I yeah, remember yeah, that yeah. from English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Crisis resolution. I, I got this, it. Too. This, you know, that's that's also handy. Uh, and what I like to do too is focus in us small thing. It can be a very small thing, like watching a movie and, and developing a crush on somebody. Mm. Uh, you don't have to take a wider theme oh, right. and tell it. And it's almost easier the smaller the incident, because right. then you can make that as rich as you right. want. Right. That, that uh, I tell, my specialization is telling uh, true stories about real people who made a difference. And I, and I have a workshop on this, and I say, don't try to do an encyclopedia entry. Nobody wants it. If you're that interested in this person, have a series of stories. It may be a whole program, but there'll be different stories right. focusing on different points. And we have 30 seconds to say goodbye. <laughs> it, it, it sneaks up. Well, I yes. think this was one of the most enjoyable uh, hours of conversation I really and story. Yes. Thank you, Mary Murphy. We've only scratched the surface. After That's having true. Me back. That's yes. true. And thank you very much for joining us. We hope you come back again. Much good cheer. Goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Seasons spinning round.